Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Ryan the Rob Mechanic channel. How the heck are you doing today? Hey, on today's video, I wanted to talk about an interesting topic, one I hadn't given too much thought to, but I had enough to put some ideas down and, and make a small video on it. Uh, one of the questions I was asked was quite simple. It's like, hey, why do rides get old? And what what's their lifetime? How do we know when they're time for replacement? We have rides out there that have been running since the 70s with no problems, and we have rides that have been put in just a couple years ago, and they're already being taken out. So kind of wanted to touch on some of those topics today. So let's get right into it. Now get ready. Here we go. First of all, thank you for watching another video. I do appreciate it. If you haven't already, now is your chance to hit that like and subscribe button down there at the bottom if you're not already done so. And uh, see what I come up with for future videos. I do have some good ones waiting in the wings out there, trying to put some notes together maybe and uh, just gather some more information on before I do my normal blabbing off about things with no research. You know, my standard MO. Okay, so today's topic, I had the question, why do rides get old, and how do we know when they retire? So this is an interesting question. I had honestly not thought about this a lot before, and of course the the question's very subjective. We can we can put a lot of emphasis on all sorts of things throughout a ride's life, but we have both ends of the spectrum. We have rides that are brand new prototype style rides that have been built and we're like nobody knows how they're going to perform nobody knows how they're going to last and we don't know what to expect out of them but if you talk with a manufacturer the manufacturer typically has a time frame that those rides should last they're like oh yeah if you take care of the ride and you're good to it and you know the steel and everything it should last you 20 30 years something somewhere along those lines Manufacturers don't typically put a date on them, however. They don't. They never say that. Um, it's more like your car. Well, how much time and effort do you put into your car that you drive around? If you put a lot in and you're constantly working on it and you make sure every little thing on that car is perfect and you wash it often, you get maybe road salts off of it, grime, things like that, that car can last a very long time. But if you never work on the thing and you abuse the crap out of it, then it's not going to last at all. Kind of the same thing with rides. So you have on that one end you have prototypes. On the other end you have these like national icon type rides that are still in use today that have been there forever. Um, probably plenty of great examples of it, but one that just came to my head was basically like Coney Island Cyclone. Cyclone. That Coney Island Cyclone has been around forever and a day right and it's still operating well that's one of the nice features about woodies is that you keep replacing them year after year after year you keep systematically replacing parts of the track so even though it's the same ride right the track and structure and stuff has basically been replaced 10 15 times on that ride probably and there's hardly any original wood left on it because wood goes bad after time that's one of the things. So let's talk about some other rides out there. Uh, I installed a giant Discovery way back about, I don't know, had to have been 2016, 2017, somewhere right around there. I installed a giant Discovery ride. And one of the first things we do when we get a ride is they come to someone like me and they say, hey, here's the manual for the ride, go through it. Um, if your company has any sort of power with the manufacturer, you can literally go through and redline parts of the manual, say, nope, we're not gonna do that, and line it out. Um, how do you do this? It's like, oh, you take everything apart every single day. It's like, how long does that take? It's like, oh, uh, well, let's see, and then you kind of get numbers together, and it's like, that's gonna take 15 hours per day to do. It's like, yeah, no, we're not gonna do that either, so you line it out. And then if the manufacturer doesn't like it, you have to come up with a working alternative to say like, okay, we wanted you to do this, but instead we're going to do this, and that fulfills the same requirement, saves all sorts of time, both sides of the party are happy, everyone agrees on it, the manual gets written that way. If you're a smaller company, smaller park, you don't have that power typically because you're not going to go back to that manufacturer and buy a bunch more rides. So you were just there for the one-off ride, so pretty much like, hey, can we get that changed in the manual? And they're like, no. 
oh, okay. The manual's it. Manual's God at that point in time. You can only do what it says at that point. Um, so going back to the giant discovery, um, in the manual, quite interestingly enough, the manufacturer actually put a time frame on the ride. I was going through annual structure, NDT, and stuff like that, and had a annual requirement and like a five-year requirement and a 10-year requirement. And then at the end, there was a 20-year requirement. And I was like, wow, they projected out 20 years. That's amazing. And at 20 years, it says that basically it said that that's the end of the ride's life. Can't be used past 20 years. And I was like, is this a typo? What's, what's going on? So I went back to the manufacturer. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't recall who the manufacturer is of that ride right off the top of my head. I know we bought it from Zamperilla, but it wasn't Zamperilla's ride. They were basically building it or servicing and selling it through from another company. But um, we Zamperilla was handling the nuts and bolts of the situation. So we went back to Zamperilla and said, um, what, what does it mean at 20 years that the ride's basically done with? And came back and said, yeah, that's right. 20 years, the ride's dead. Uh, so there's no extra NDT requirement or anything else like that? And they said, nope. At 20 years, you have to replace the ride. Really? 20 years, we have to replace the ride? And they go, yep, that's what it is. Now, that seems like a very outlandish requirement to me. But thinking back on all the flat rides like that style ride that I've worked on, yeah, around 20 years is about how long they last. And then they just kind of naturally just start falling apart. And one thing on those giant discoveries that they were very uh, critical about is all the fatigue because you have the four big outriggers sitting down there and the big pendulum arm running down the center. They were concerned about fatigue and all that stuff. Um, I know I've, I've seen a ride of a uh, similar to a kind of looks like a giant discovery, but they're very small. It was a traveling park model. It was a traveling model, um, you know, I think it was over in India where the arm came out and the whole arm just broke in half as the pendulum came up. And it's like, yeah, that's that's fatigue. Well, that was uncaught fatigue that the the operator never looked at. But um, so it's like, hmm, that's interesting. But, you know, you step back and you say, well, what's the price tag on the ride? The ride was probably... I don't know what it actually was. I'm just going to venture a guess. Just go, bloop, pull my guess back in. I'm going to guess the ride was under a million dollars for that giant discovery. Total guess. Got no information behind that whatsoever. Um, so for a million dollars, 20 years, okay. Now it kind of makes sense, actually. It's like, all right, so 20 years down the road, you just replace the ride okay yeah i could see that new everything just literally buy a new ride they put a time stamp on it, it said 20 years that thing is done if you love it and it's an awesome addition to your park then buy another one of those you'll have newer drive technology new seat technology new everything and it'll work even that much more better uh, so you it's like a massive it's like a major retrofit <laughs> retrofit buying a new ride that's a retrofit uh but it's like okay so i started thinking about other things most manufacturers that i've seen um Zamperla included i never see anything like an expected lifespan of a ride at all it never says like hey it should last this long i've seen warranties on motors and gearboxes and things like that that said well these should laugh last uh you know, 30,000 hours or something like that. Motors and things are typically put into runtime hours, but uh, never really for a ride. So one of the thoughts out there is like, okay, when I first heard this question, my thought first turned to wooden roller coasters. And woodies are kind of interesting. Like I said in the beginning of the video, you have this ability to replace the entire track and structure. You can replace 100% of it. In fact, on our old GCI coaster, 
um, on a kind of a heavier year, we would replace about 30% of the track on a heavy year of refurbishment. Lighter years are more like 15 to 20% of the track. But that means roughly every five, six years, that ride had an entire brand new track put on it. And then the structure we didn't do much to, but in high stressed areas that where the, the train really pulled the structure hard in those areas, we would also work in the structure really hard and take parts of the structure down and replace them as well. So we were in fact rebuilding the ride the whole time. Things that didn't get touched that much is like the lift hill, some of the slower areas of the rides where you're just transporting from one side of the, the track to the other, you know, low stress areas. Those are, don't get tra uh, touched much, but high G-force and overbanked areas like that on woodies, they get beat up pretty good. And a lot of times when you start seeing that fatigue in the supporting members, it's not just at the bottom, it's midway up and it's at the top, it's everywhere in there because everything just takes that pounding as a train goes around. So you have to replace those. So because of that, you would think, well, your lifespan's pretty low on that type of ride then. It's actually opposite because you're constantly replacing the track, like the cyclone we were talking about earlier. Um, you You never really get out of you never really come up to the end of life it's just like okay we just keep replacing wood just keep replacing track that's just a normal thing all right so what about the trains trains can be refurbished every time you start getting fatigue in the steel absolutely for wooden roller coasters you start getting fatigue and then you go to a manufacturer and say hey i need new trains you go to the manufacturer and say i need new trains uh, they will sell you new trains. Uh, you can go, if the manufacturer no longer exists, you can go to a company. I've brought this up before. Uh, you can go to a company like uh, Premier. They're good with that sort of stuff. And you say, hey, Premier, I need new trains for this ride. And they go, okay. And they get the information, and then they figure out if they can sell you new trains for the ride. Um, every manufacturer has their specialty. Uh, Premier, I'm, I'm not sure. Premier might not actually make trains for wooden roller coasters. They might be like, no, we don't want to touch that. You might be able to go to a GCI type manufacturer and say, I need these trains replaced. Okay. Um, and that's when, you know, you might look at serious overhauls in the rest of the track and structure. Like, can you overhaul the lift and the brakes and the control system? Then we can get away from the old Philadelphia toboggan style trains and we can get you to something more modern that's going to ride better and be better for your guests and easier on people's backs and necks and everything else. Um, so wooden roller coasters, in hindsight, they kind of have like an infinite lifespan. And I say, well, why do we tear them down then? It's like, well, you think about it. What happens when they tear down a wooden roller coaster? It was typically, it's, I mean, we use the term old. It was old. It was built in the 60s. It's like, okay, granted. Um, but it wasn't at the coaster's useful life end expectancy. It might have been a fin financial decision. They said, yes, we'd want to retrofit the trains and the track and the brakes and everything else. And to do that, we'd have to retrack the entire thing. And then we'd have to, you know, put new brakes in and get new trains and everything like that. And then at that point, you are just slightly off the cost of a new roller coaster at that point. And then that's up to the park's decision. Well, what is this ride really bringing? And they look at it and they go, has it got a huge queue line every weekend? No, it doesn't. Do people love it? No, people complain about that thing like crazy. Okay, so they're not really seeing the value to put back into that thing. Back to your car, right? We tell, look at your car and you say, my car is falling apart. It's a piece of crap. Like it barely works. It barely gets me to work in the morning. I can't stand that car. When the engine breaks down and the mechanic says, yeah, your engine's shot, you're going to need a new one, it's going to be $5,000. You have the same decision. Do I want to put $5,000 back into that car and make it run good again? Or do I want to say, nope, I'm going to use that money towards a new car because the rest of that is just not worth putting the money into anymore. Same exact decisions parks have to make. So... 
that's a wooden roller coaster. I feel like that was a pretty good coverage of that. Yeah, I'm going to say it was. <laughs> so next we can talk about some of the small flat rides and things like that. I'll kind of get a break off the roller coasters for a second. Um, those also have the same thing. They kind of last for a very long time until you find a major problem with them. Um, most of the time it is the exact same thing like the car and the engine. It's like we take the thing apart and refurbish it and put it back together. And then like a uh, Zamperla Samba balloons, uh, something like a, like a mini balloon ride. You know, we get in there and then right in the structural bend where the top part of the ride comes up and then that allows the upper canopy to twist at that angle and keep going up. Right in that bend, we find some pretty big cracks inside there. It's like, oh, that's not good. To go back to Zamprilla. I haven't done this. This is not a conversation with them. Just I'm just making a theoretical, theoretical thing here, right? And I go back to Zamprilla and say, hey, I found a bunch of big cracks on the inside. Can we repair those? And Zamprilla gets all the information, pictures, measurements, and they evaluate with the life with the with the length that that ride has already been in service. And they might come back and say. No, we're not gonna we're not gonna sanction a repair for that. So what's the what do we do to get this back up and running? Well, that entire tree section, that's what those centerpieces are called. The entire tree, you need to replace it with a new one. Do you have those sitting on the shelf? No. They have to be custom fabricated to whatever your ride was built to. So they need a ton of measurements and pictures and everything to make sure that their prints back at the factory are going to match what you actually have out at the ride. Um, Zamprillas in general are extremely tricky in this, extremely tricky, because the manufacturer has been bought and sold so many times, right? It's gone out of business, it's come back, it's been bought and sold all these different times, all these different revisions of these rides, and the rides are so good that they normally make, people are looking around, what? What did he just say? Yeah, no, actually, yeah. The rides are so good that they make is that they're the number one cloned ride out there. People clone Zamperilla rides all the time. So manufacturer X, you know, some little tiny manufacturer goes out there and they literally get a hold of one of those Zamperilla rides, measure and literally carbon copy the ride in their shop and they start selling it as their own. Well, records weren't that great 20, 30 years ago. And these things start going out there. Name plates get defaced. Uh, serial numbers get taken off and things like that. And next thing you know, you're talking with Zamparilla about fixing this ride. And Zamparilla's scratching their head because they're like, we can never honestly figure out how you got a hold of that ride. Um, the park I worked at, we actually had one of those rides. It was a kid's swing there was like 20 seats on the swing, which we only ran 10 for this little tiny thing. It only spun at like 5 RPM, super slow. Like possibly the dumbest ride I could ever think of. Like it looks like something you made in your backyard on the inside. And it was just like, really? This is, we're going to pass this off as a ride, huh? And it, and it behaved that way. No one ever waited in line for that. No one was ever riding that thing. Nobody wanted to ride it. They took it out a little bit later. But we dug into it because I went to Zamperlo for parts. Like all your other rides are here, you know, we got all this stuff. And they said, send us pictures. And I send them pictures and they're like, uh, uh, yeah, that, that looks like it. Send us measurements. And I send them all the measurements and they go, we don't know what that is. And I'm like, what do you mean? You don't know what that is. It's a kitty swing ride. And they're like, yeah, it looks like one of ours, but it's not one of ours take some pictures of these areas we take pictures of it and they're like yep nope that is not our ride really yep so we had a cloned ride sitting there that uh, was it was passed from one boneyard to another and when i say the term boneyard you know it's when parks get rid of rides they typically don't throw them away they take them and put them in a storage area somewhere in case another park needs something to put in for their area. Maybe they're building a kid's area or something like that. They need something new to them, but uh, they don't want to spend the capital on it. So they start calling around to the parks and they say, well, what do you have laying around your boneyard? We had a handful of kitty rides sitting there. We had a 
Zamprilla balloon like Ferris wheel that went around. We had one of those sitting there. We had one of the very rare Huss fly willy rides. That was that was a rare one, but we got rid of that in one area, but we didn't want to throw it away. So we put it on a boneyard, and eventually another park would come ask for that thing, probably. But uh, as I know, it's still sitting there, I think, at this point right now. At this point in time, if you haven't already, make sure you please like and subscribe. I know most of you have probably forwarded past this part because I talk a lot, and pretty much no one's going to listen to this. But if you just happen to be one of those people that is sitting there listening to this, it's probably because you're at work and nobody's looking around and you got your earphones in and you're kind of looking around right now saying, hey, someone watching me? No, it's fine. It's cool. I'm not going to tell anybody, but that comes at a price. You need to hit that, hit that subscribe button. I'm just saying, it's right down there. And also, if you want to contact me, you can always leave it in a comment down below. That's perfectly fine. Or I've also got an email address. It is ryantherivemechanic at yahoo.com. If you want to email me a question that maybe you don't want to ask on here, it's fine as well. Move around to other rides that are maybe a little higher stress that are the correct ride. Um, we had a regatta. Regattas are fairly common rides. They just sit there. There's uh, typically 15, 16 tubs around in a big circle and the ride just sits there and spins really fast around. So the regatta, we had stress cracks develop in the arm way up by the knuckle where it attaches to the center hub. And we had some stress cracks up there and it affected pretty much all of them. And it was a safety concern, so we shut the ride down. Like we couldn't let it operate with the stress cracks on there. So we shut the ride down. We tried sanctioning a repair. Our engineering worked on it. Zamprilla worked on it. We put it all back together, ran it for a little while longer, and then we had another crack pop up in one of the arms. So that was enough to throw up the final red flag, and everyone's like, okay, that thing is done. Like, uh, our corporate at the time said, uh, what do you want to do with it? And we said, well, we got quotes for new arms, and it was going to be like, $50,000 for new arms for that ride. And we're like, well, we don't want to put $50,000 into that ride. And then they said, oh, I, I, bet we can, I bet we can get another ride for probably just a couple hundred thousand and put in a whole new ride in that spot. So we didn't run the ride for like a year and a half while we were sitting there looking around for stuff. Um... And no one was really pushing on us. We had the, the ride was a low throughput ride, so it never had a big line, so it just sat on the back side of the park. And it was just down for like a year and a half. And then uh, eventually we had one of the corporate guys said, Hey, what's going on with this ride? And we explained it all to him and said, Look, it's, they want a bunch of money for the arms, but we just don't want to put the money into it, so we're trying to look for something else. And the, the guy who was a good guy, he, he was like, Listen, you can't get a ride for that price installed, up and running, and commissioned for that. You, you can't get a ride for that. It's not going to happen. Is it just either get rid of the ride completely, tear it out 100%, or just pay the money and fix the ride. So the park made the decision. They paid the money, purchased all new sweep arms for the ride, put it back together. It still took like five or six months once we ordered the sweep arms because they had to be made by Zamperla and they were flown in or boated in from Italy. So that still took a while to do, but we got everything all back and up and running. And, you know, you could do speculation. I think there was all sorts of speculation when that happened. It's like, oh, they're going to take that down and they're going to put in a tower ride right there and because it had a small round footprint so they're, we're going to put in a drop tower right there and it's going to be amazing and all this other stuff and blah 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 and in the background we're just sitting there just like looking for a ride to put in this spot anything anything let's see what's on craigslist rides on craigslist what do we do <laughs> so like, okay, so there's some flat rides that we talk about, like, the the arm feature was pretty much, that was that ride's, we decided that that could have been that ride's end of its life. Like, realistically, that was enough money, 
and we pretty much did not want to throw the money at that ride. So that was that ride's end of life, pretty much. But then at the very last minute, the 11th hour, we saved it and said, okay, we're going to put the money back into it. And honestly, the arm should last for another 10, 15, 20 years, depending on its usage and maintenance and everything else. Those type of rides, you run the arm bearings loose to where the arms move nice and free each time, you'll crack them in a heartbeat. So, got to run them tight. <laughs> so, let's move on to some steel roller coasters. But I want to talk about the types of things that we get into with the rides. So, we have seen recently rides come up and they're like, okay, oh, we're, we're going to get rid of this ride. Um, there was an Intamin Impulse post coaster, a, a U-shaped coaster that was out there. And uh, then there was the Volcano Blaster coaster. They got rid of them. And, and people asked, like, why are they tearing out all these perfectly good rides and, and not do anything about them? So, okay, this is a great part of this topic to talk about. So, essentially, that is the ride's end of its useful life. And that was the, the life that the park gave that ride. I mean, that's what they did to that ride. Uh, let's see, Volcano Blaster. I can't remember the other one, but I believe it was at uh, Cedar Point. I could see it clear as day in my head, but I can't think of the name right now. I know. I, you leave it in the comments down below. I know. Yeah, everyone will. They said, hey, we don't want to deal with this anymore. And parks, uh, people would ask me, well, like, why would they not, why would they opt to rip something like that out? Well, the suspended impulse coasters had all sorts of troubles from Intamin, like tons of troubles with them. And it was mainly, my opinion, this is all this is, my opinion, it was because of how far away the people were from the track, right? You had to, they had the track way up there and the people were way down low. So, and then you had an acceleration on top of that. Um, this was in the early days of impulse coasters when they were still just like, yes, let's just, we are going to accelerate you whether you like it or not, and it's going to be awesome. And that worked out pretty well. But one of the things is that that stress has to go somewhere, and it went into the frame of the train. And so it was like, okay, so the train started developing all sorts of cracks all over them, just everywhere and then the manufacturer started coming out with service bulletins and saying hey you need to weld fish plates and doubler plates in there and those plates are basically like hey where two joints come together the manufacturer put them together like that and then they ran a weld down the center and they're like that's a joint we're done and then they came back and they said okay well we found a crack in that area so it's because the steel is doing this and they went okay so they put a doubler plate on that and fish plates doubler plates they're kind of the same type deal it's basically a steel band-aid so if you think about it you take that joint that's like that and then you cut a piece of steel and you put it directly over that joint and you weld that piece of steel all the way around and now you essentially doubled the size of that joint and you they could be put anywhere on all sorts of stuff and they're done kind of as band-aids um, but more long-term solution type band-aids so it's not like a just a temporary thing it's something i said yeah by doing this this material this size everything it moves the stress around in the frame differently so the engineers can say yep now the stress has moved there the stress has lowered in that area yep it should be good so that style, style ride started having all sorts of problems with that. The old style trains had a backbone that came down and that used, it looked like three bolts holding the backbone on. It actually wasn't. The center was actually a pin that was a had bushings on it that the whole thing rested on. And then to each outside, those were safety bolts. In case the pin sheared, it would the safety bolts would catch the assembly. But... All that had lots of welding and stress and everything in that frame. So flash forward to newer trains. And the newer trains now have got rid of that middle section in there. The steel up on top was a beefier selection. And they were just built differently. But then we started having problems with 
cracking wheel carriers and things like that. And this is stuff like once you find them during the rehab, you have to not only make the repairs, but you have to come up with a future something to prevent things from happening and then implement it to the entire rest of the train during that off season because you can't just go back to it time and time again. So quite a pain in the ass, but that's not the death sentence for those rides. The death sentence for those rides is the drive. The drive on those rides is the death sentence. So I've talked about this before on other videos is that the impulse coasters, inductive rides, synchronous rides, anything like that, there's three components to it. There's the mechanical ride to it. There is the drive system that runs pretty much everything in the ride. And then there's the PLC control system. Now the thing is, is that when you make a ride, when I get out there and say, hey, I'm gonna make a ride today and it's gonna be awesome. I went to the hardware store, I picked up wheels, all sorts of stuff. This is gonna be so cool, let's do this. So when we build that ride and put it together, it's a, it's a happy marriage between those three. The mechanical aspect of the ride, the drive system that moves the trains around, and the PLC system saying everything is safe. Well, what happens when the drive runs out of juice? Well, the drive system is no longer valid. It's like, okay, well, there's still plenty of companies that make that style drive system. You could just take that drive system and put it in there. Mm, but you can't. Most companies won't take over other companies' stuff. Well, what's that mean to me? That means that if you want to put that, if you want to fix that drive system that's there because it's giving you all sorts of faults and problems and stuff like that, you need to 100% wipe that out of the ride. All controls, all aspects, and all everything. That includes the ride's PLC because it was talking to that drive. And you need to install a whole new setup. So the ride needs a brand new PLC. The drive system needs a brand new control system. It needs new stators. It needs new magnets. It needs new everything. And the engineering for all that has to be redone for that ride. It's not just about going to some company and just saying, hey, can you make a drive system for something? Oh yeah, we can do that. It's, okay, great, here's some money. And you can do that for us. Nope, there's a lot of engineering that changes hands on these things. And then that engineering, just like a new ride, it's gotta be approved by the manufacturer of the ride. It's gotta be approved by the parks engineering. It's gotta be approved by a corporate. More than likely, there's an insurance company that's gonna have to approve this, insur this uh, engineering as well. And then there's probably going to be a third party inspector that has to approve it as well. And like everyone's got to sign off on this and it's got to be good. So it's like, well, okay, they can do that. It's like, yes, they can. At that point in time, you're pretty much at the cost of the ride. A brand new ride probably sitting there with that cost. So that's one of the reasons why something like a drive system on an impulse coaster can take the entire ride down and take it out of commission because you're not going to get Intamin to approve another vendor putting its drive system in their ride. It's not going to happen. There's too much liability. As soon as you say, hey, we want to go away from Intamin and we want to go with Supplier X and put a new impulse system in this ride, Intamin says, by doing that, we you are releasing 100% of the liability that is no longer our ride. You could take the Intamin name off of it because it's not ours anymore. At that point in time, we will not stand behind anything, which means well, you say like, okay, tell them to go hit the bricks. What's the big deal? So what that means is that Say, I do. I put a brand new drive system in there. Yeah, we had company X do it. It's awesome. The thing works great. It's like, oh, 